let's let's deal with whatever unhealthy narrative we have about our own worthiness, our own abilities, our own, you know, our potentiality is really what it boils down to. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Inside Out Career Design Podcast. Our guest today is Scott Perry. Scott is a husband, father, teacher, musician, encore life coach, author, podcast host, and chief difference maker at Creative On Purpose. He helps people get clear about and closer to what they want in the second half of life so they can live their legacy. Scott believes you enhance your life most through endeavors that serve others. That's why we were so excited to talk with Scott, because we are in total alignment with that belief and wanted to dig deeper on it. And in our conversation, we talk about how to break free from negative emotions and thought patterns by focusing on objective problem solving. Why people reach a crisis in midlife when they realize that external achievements have not brought them happiness and fulfillment. How to solve problems by using a simple three-step process to navigate life's challenges. And how to implement the idea of playing your own game by rediscovering who you really are what you're really good at, and where you really belong. And now, it's time to listen and learn from Scott. Welcome, Scott. A week ago, we got to know each other, and here we are already for our podcast conversation. We're making a ruckus, as our mutual <laughs> connection, Seth Godin, would say. So. You've made quite a big career pivot from having been a guitar teacher for 30 years to now being an encore life coach. You know that we are asking for those what's next moments in your life. So please tell us what caused you to take that leap. Um, so th first of all, thank you very much for having me. And it's a, a great question. I feel like I've been I'm, I'm kind of wired to hear and heed the call of vocation. I I did many different things through my uh, childhood and teenage years, went to school to become a teacher, started off as a teacher teaching at some famous institutions that people might recognize, decided that, you know, then I heard, had this calling to become a musician. I, I heeded that. The calling to become an encore life coach um, was initiated by our mutual friend, Seth Godin. Uh, I participated in the Alta MBA 6 in August of 2016 with the idea that I was going to build my online digital guitar empire. By the time I was done with the Alta MBA, I didn't even want to teach guitar anymore, or play guitar anymore. I, I didn't know what I was going to do next, but I knew there was something that was next for me. And I just continue to let that still small voice in the back of my head whisper to me um, and and just micro step my way into what I'm doing now, mostly through uh, blogging out loud and in public to anybody that would read, uh, broadcasting out loud and in public to anyone that would listen or anyone that would join me for a conversation. And it was through those conversations with myself and with other people and paying attention to the feedback that I was getting that I, you know, clarified what it was, what that what's next was supposed to be, um, which has taken different forms at different times. But, you know, this my current endeavor of, um, you know, being an encore life coach, being the ch chief difference maker, at creative on purpose and, you know, being the um, the guide in, in, in these communities um, just really feels like this is this is the path that I'm meant to be on now. Um, so I don't know if that fully answers your your question or not. But um, yeah, it's just I, I think I think some of us are wired to 
just tune into that still small voice, that wee small voice in the back of our head. Um, and, and follow, uh, you know, follow the call of, of vocation. And, um, I just feel really, you know, blessed and lucky that, that things have worked out for me the way I have. Not to mention that you've written, I think, eight books. I don't know. You're, you you may have written another one since we last talked a week ago. He Not... just launched in February. Oh, okay. So it's gonna it's gonna be nine. <laughs> so I was going through read a couple of we read two of your books. Amazing, insightful, easy to digest, no fluff, great books. And one of them is called Onward, where certainty ends, possibility begins, and in that book you point out something so beautiful and important. The context that you tell in the book is the hero or the heroine's journey. So I'm going to paraphrase here a little bit. So you are the hero or heroine of your own story. So I understand you have responsibilities, insecurities, anxieties, and a, a range of reasons. You should just continue as you were, mm -hmm. but you have a choice continue to let life happen to you or decide it's time you let life happen through you. What does it mean to you to let life happen through you? And how does it apply to people trying to figure out what's next for their life? Yeah, uh, this is another great question. So the secret that's revealed at the end of Onward is that the, the process that you've um, alluded to is actually my perspective and, uh, you know, my approach to a, um, a to a, a little slice of Stoic philosophy called the three disciplines, um, the discipline of perception, the discipline of action and the discipline of will. And um, so one of the, the, the things about Stoic philosophy is they they believe in destiny. They believe that life is causal, that things are unfolding as they are intended to unfold, um, that there's this divine animating spark that permeates not only all human life, but all life on the planet and, and permeates the entirety of the cosmos. Now, for some people, the idea that, um, that, that destiny is unfolding as it is meant to unfold will cause people to say, well, if it's going to happen the way it's going to happen, why don't I just sit back and wait for life to happen? Um, in Stoicism, that's called the lazy argument because you can't know what destiny has in store for you. And the Stoics believe um, that the only thing that matters is virtue, the content of your character, not just what you believe in, but the way that you show up and the way that you engage with the people that you find yourself with. And so that that's where that idea of, you know, there are pe there are some people we and and we probably have all been this person at various moments in our life where we play the role of the victim. Life is happening to us. Everything is beyond my control. Um, you know, I wrote that book as the coronavirus uh, the pandemic was, you know, just getting started. I wrote it in part as a as a way to help people navigate their way through um, the pandemic, and um, yeah, there you, you could you could play the victim. You could say, "Well, life is just happening to me, and I'm just gonna sit down and um, wait for this thing to pass, or wait for somebody to fix it, or whatever." Um, and you know, the call to action that I'm sharing in that book is, although destiny is unfolding as it may you find yourself moment to moment to moment moment what i call faded moments so fate is what's happening right now and in every faded moment you have the power to um, take charge of what is within your control what's within our control well not much you know as i said we can't control other people we can't control events we can't control the weather um, we can't control almost anything except we can control the way that we see ourselves in our situation and we can we control our decisions and what we decide and do next and that by doing that life is now happening through you that you are an agent 
of your destiny and not merely the victim or the passive recipient of your destiny. So doesn't this get tricky, though, between thinking, you know, determinism would say the same thing. Everything is determined. So I can see, well, if it tell me everything is I, I, I'm kind of confused about determinism that everything is happening, but it's happening through you. I think you've got to help me out here. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's it's, it's I have this conversation almost daily. And, <laughs> I bet. And I would say, so again, it just depends on how you want to play the game, right? And so if you want to play, um, you know, you, you can play the game that we're all instructed to play. You know, we, we go to school and, are, and we receive external instruction and validation for how we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. And then it just gets amplified through institutionalized occupation. Um, and... And many of us will play that game and come to a point, usually in midlife, where we can't figure out why, you know, even though we have won the game, um, that we are not as happy, nearly as happy as we feel we should be. Um, with the, 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 the destiny and determinism and, and, and all that, it's the, the best way I can frame it is it's a both and situation. So. I believe that things are unfolding the way that they're meant to, to um, unfold. And I choose to be an agent in that process. Uh, and I choose to, so one, one of the way that the Stoics talk about it is um, you're like a dog that's tied to a cart and the cart is going where the cart is going to go. You can be dragged by the cart or you can walk alongside it. And so I decide I'm going to walk alongside it and, in, and, and influence as I can. And also, you know, I also accept that I may, this may, this point of view may be entirely wrong. Um, I don't, I can't know. I can't know. So because it's uncertain, because, um, uh, that there's, you know, possibility. I choose to participate as actively and engaged as I can. Um, and if things are unfolding the way they're meant to unfold, um, I'm still playing, I'm playing my game and I'm playing my game all in and full out. And that that's where the reward is. The reward is not in what you get or where you end up or where destiny tells you you're going to, or where destiny, um, you know, puts you. The reward is in how you show up, how you play your game, how you leverage your talents and skills uh, and, and, and the content of your character uh, and, and engage with other people and en engage with life's inevitable challenges and triumphs. Mm. So Have I helped at I all, don't... Peter? <laughs> You're just perfect <clears throat> example, just like your books are so clear. So now I really understand you can I can walk along the cart so I am still a participant I am still I am still influencing other people because the idea of virtue pretty hard to argue with virtue who doesn't like to be around people who are virtuous and so there there is some influencing happening and the idea that we can't really know there is a certain mystery in there that just is beautifully explained yeah Well and I love that that word that you just used mystery cuz I think that that is essential, that the embrace of the mystery is essential. When we are children, you all saw my, my grandson Jasper just a few minutes before we went live. You know, I am bearing witness again to this, um, to, to seeing someone in experiencing all of the awe and wonder of what I consider to be the mundane, a bird flying to the bird feeder outside the window is something that is appears to be a miracle and a, an endless source of curiosity and wonder to Jasper. I don't think about that anymore, but when I see it through Jasper's eyes, suddenly that's this amazing thing. And so I think that a big part of thriving through life, whether it's challenging or easy at that moment, is embracing everything that's happening 
with that sense of curiosity, awe, wonder, um, and and uh, just embracing you know the full and and, and embracing our our perspective and again deciding and doing what what we feel is what we need to decide to and do next mm-hmm. i just want to before you cut me off i just want to no i have one more thing to say i, I <laughs> bet <laughs> i just wanted to to go back to the point when you said um so i don't know but i can still choose right because you write uh, to change how you think and feel about yourself and how things are, you need to change the stories you're telling yourself. And I think that is a very difficult thing for many people. Choose your story, uh, choose your future. I think that's, that's what you said. So this is fascinating. Please expand on the idea of the stories we tell ourselves and how someone can choose a different story and create a different future in your view. Yeah. Um, well, you're, you're hitting on my favorite things to talk about, so I really appreciate that. It's a great question. Um, you know, one of the reasons why stoicism endures is because even though it got a lot of things wrong in terms of um, the physics of how the world works and um, that sort of thing, it got a lot of the, the human elements, the psychology and the sociology right and it's you know stoicism is built on the premise that we are inherently social creatures and we are inherently we are we are um we have this instinct for rationality or reasonable uh, or or reason now that doesn't mean that we act reasonably or rationally in fact you don't have to look far to see that we don't most of the time but we do have that capacity and so One of the things that we know about human beings is that we have always made sense of ourselves, each other, our situation through narrative. We tell ourselves stories about who we are, who the other is, and what's going on. That's all, that's all storytelling. Now, again, we can, you know, we can find ourselves in a situation and we can tell ourselves the the victim story and um, none of it's our fault. And none of and and there's nothing that we can do, and we're just going to sit and wait for the um, the perpetrator perpetrator to stop um, messing with us, or we're going to wait for the hero to come and save us, um, or we can choose to tell ourselves a story about the fact that although a lot of this is outside of our control, I get to decide how I see this and how I'm going to approach it. Um, one of my heroes is Viktor Frankl, who wrote a fantastic book called Man's Search for Meaning that I read at least every year, uh, once a year. And, you know, he, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but, you know, he, he spent, I think it was either seven years and four different Nazi death camps or the other way around. But regardless, he was, um, he experienced a lot of pain and suffering and he witnessed an unbearable amount of pain and suffering and his approach to navigating that situation and holding on to his humanity and his hope um, and, and, you know, his faith that he would persevere was to um, be a, as of great a service as he could to, to his fellow um, inmates. And he exited that situation, not stripped of his humanity, not broke, broken, but broken open. And, you know, with this insight that he wanted to share with the world, it's called logos therapy. Um, and it's, you know, about this idea that, um, human beings are meaning making creatures and we can make meaning, we can forge meaning and build identity and find a sense of flourishing in any situation or circumstances. And so when I say choose your story, choose your future, it sounds simple because it is simple. Unfortunately, most of the simple things in life are not very easy because we have all this default programming um, and we have our you know old habits that are hard to break. Um, but if we choose to, again, micro step our way into 
a different narrative, we will find ourselves living into a very different future than we find ourselves in in any given moment. I love that distinction between simple and easy. Mm. Um, so beautifully said. Thank you so much. You, you want it? When, when we talk about that s story, are you talking about this is the, the story inside of our head that we're telling ourselves our assumptions about ourselves and the stories of am I adequate or not adequate, inadequate, all, this, all that kind of stuff, right? I think, I think that a lot of, um, you know, I, I've, I've thought a lot about, you know, having worked with, you know, hundreds of clients in my own practice, but, you know, through my role as a head coach in a couple of workshops, I worked with literally thousands of, of students and the conversations, um, you know, when we start to talk about things like fear, uh, imposter syndrome, Stephen Pressfield's resistance with a capital R, um, we are, I think, talking about our inner narrative around our own worthiness. And I think, you know, I used to say worthiness and belonging, but I think it's just, I think it starts with worthiness because if you if you start with belonging you know if that desire for belonging is is number one you'll find belonging in in places where um you may find yourself suffering and profoundly unhappy it but if if you trust yourself and invest in yourself and you do that you know if you heed the exhortation uh, inscribed across the Oracle of Delphi, know thyself. If you, if you really do that deep inner work of knowing yourself, embracing your inherent sufficiency and worthiness, um, you will find where you belong because where you belong is with people that share your values and need your talents to enhance their lives and whose talents you need to enhance your life. And so, I really do believe, you know, that we have to start from that, you know, most of the time it's let's let's deal with whatever unhealthy narrative we have about our own worthiness, our own abilities, our own, you know, our potentiality is really what it boils down to. What kind of influences you have, yeah, you invite kind of... into your life, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, that, there's some really interesting science around this now. So. We've all heard the Jim, well, I don't think he really said it, but it's um, it's attributed to him. The Jim Rohn quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Turns out that that's actually not true. Um, so maybe it's good that Jim Rohn didn't say it um, or that, that we don't have a uh, direct citation. Um, the science shows that you are the cumulative average of everyone in your direct network and the people in each of those per people's network and the people in those people's network and one more time. So it's not just your, it's three, it's th an, an, uh, three orders of separation. The, one of the things I remember from the study is like, if, if you, if you are hanging, you, you don't have to hang out with smokers to be a smoker. If the people you hang out with have smokers in their network, the likelihood of your being a smoker has a has a measurable um, percentage of, of increase. And so you have to be, you know, I think, again, that's why we have to first really try to do our best to dial in who we really are, what are my values? Um, am I am I living my values or are they just espoused values that I like to share because it makes me look like a good person? Um, what are my guiding principles? What are you know what are the things upon which I will not equivocate? What, what what do I let in? What do I keep out? And what's my the vision of the world that I have that I want to um, live in and and uh, co-create and then you think about, well, who am I going to do that with? Who am I going to do that for? And you start to spend a lot more, 
attention, you pay a lot more attention uh, to who you're associating yourself with. And you have a lot more integrity about what you do and who you do it with and where you do it. And, you know, sometimes when I'm talking about this, people say, well, you know, what about my family? You know, my family doesn't, has different values than me. They don't support me. Um, I don't, I don't agree with the way they live their lives or what have you. And I, I am, you know, I'm not an, a proponent of, you know, cut yourself off from your, your family or ditch all your loser friends that are bringing down your average. Um, but you do have the ability to decide how, how much of your valuable time, attention, and energy are you giving people that, um, you know, who are not helping you uh, or not supporting and encouraging the life and, and the person that you're trying to become. Um, and you can reclaim that time, attention, and energy and reinvest it in people that are supporting and encouraging uh, you and maybe walking alongside you as you're trying to find your path. Mm. Mm. And watch out because <laughs> you might be connected to half of the world, right? <laughs> According to what you just said, That's it's, amazing. it's huge, wow. huge. Yeah. The influence yeah. that, that touch you every moment of your life. It's, it's really incredible. Now, Scott, You've stated that you can't be grateful and anxious at the same time. And this is such good news. Um, and you also say that that gratitude helps you see opportunities in the obstacles before you and to find the silver lining in your situation. There's no getting around the fact that people that are trying to figure out what's next are going to encounter difficulties and obstacles. You, you know that. Um, in fact, there will always be obstacles in our lives. So talk about how appreciation and gratitude helps with all that. Oh, this is another great question. So um, that particular quote, I, I can't remember who said it but it's one of it's someone that's that uh, that whose work i connected with through seth and what she says is you can't be anxious anxious and curious at the same time which i think is another another idea worth contemplating um you know that's tied to this idea that anxiety and excitement manifest exactly the same way physiologically you know your your pupils dilate you start to break out into a sweat your heart beats a little bit faster um, and, you know, as a musician, that was good news to me because I experienced quite a bit of anxiety, especially when I was playing, you know, with people who I really respected or who might be famous or, um, was on a big stage. And, you know, I was not normally a person that was prone to stage fright, but whenever the stakes got, you know, raised, so I, I would have that and I would use that little trick to just trick myself into being excited rather than anxious. This idea of gratitude, you can't be, um, uh, you can't be thankful and anxious at the same time is, you know, grew out of that idea because again, studying the, you know, the, the, the science, the data that's out there, um, you know, gratitude is, I think, the two levers that we have at our disposal all the time that are scientifically proven to reduce stress, um, to help us see opportunity and optionality, um, and to reduce anxiety and increase um, joy and fulfillment are gratitude and generosity. So um, I, you know, Marcus Aurelius is the first book of his meditations, he thanks everybody that's touched his life for what they gave him. And some of the people he's thanking are, were not incredible role models or great people, but he found something in everyone that touched his life that provided him um, with a lesson. And he expressed directly his gratitude for those people. And 
I took that idea and his, you know, just the idea of journaling in general. And I would, I had this gratitude practice um, that I did for, I, well, I still do, but I, I, it's been years. And I began to experience this, you know, this sense of equanimity and seeing more possibility and seeing a reduction in not just anxiety, but also anger or frustration just through this practice of gratitude. Um, and I guess, you know, I should also credit my wife. My wife had a grat gratitude practice for years before I adopted it. was always saying, you should try this gratitude thing. It's really working for me. And I had to, you know, I, it took me a little while to, you know, because I'm a man. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, a while to get with it. But once I did, I, I experienced the same thing that she experienced. And here's, here's the thing that really um, flipped the script for me was, I went through a period of time, and this is not uncommon. You know, people, uh, we all talk about midlife crisis because it's a real thing and it, it, it's a crisis that often happens in somewhere in that 40 to 65 range. Um, you know, I went through one of those periods where I felt like I was really broken. And because of my gratitude practice, I started leaning into, well, why don't I be grateful for this catastrophe that's happening in my life? And by doing that, I began to not just see that there were ways that I could navigate myself through this situation. You know, the, the Robert Frost quote, the, um, the way out is through, um, which I found to be true, but it doesn't happen until you step into. And so, this idea that we can, and I think Viktor Frankl, um, you know, speaks to this too, by embracing the challenges, the difficulties, the catastrophes, the tragedies, the trials, um, expressing our gratitude for those things, because those are the moments that really um, test our character, forge our character, that increase, um, that, that help us practice the virtues of humility and patience and acceptance. And it helps us um, uh, become resilient and, and build that muscle of resilience, which I think resilience is not just returning to where you were. I think resilience is, uh, the power of resilience is that usually when we are, are able to practice that through a difficult situation, we emerge even stronger than before we entered, even better than before we entered. And so that's all, it all begins with gratitude. We have to be able to be grateful for all of it, not just the wins, not just the moments of celebration, but for the challenges, for the difficulties, for the trials and the tribulations. It's, we have to embrace the whole package and that that's what makes for a rich and meaningful and fulfilling life. Yeah, because it's often those things where that we prefer to push away from us that really teaches us something. And Peter and I, we have a gratitude practice that every every night before we fall asleep, we share what we are grateful for. And those can be things that are that didn't work out the way we really wanted them to work out but the little nuggets that are in those things that really push us forward that help us and it can be also things that we just take for granted each and every day that if you look and and expand your view into the world you see that for example somebody sitting in a car in traffic and 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 shouting at my goodness i'm going to be late for work billions of people would give their their hand and feet to sit in traffic and and, and waiting right so those are the little things and the little mind shifts or thought shifts that that each and every one can do and it leads to a more fulfilling and happy life, I'd say. Absolutely. I think in William B. Is it William B. Irvine or William P. Irvine who wrote 
he taught me a great thing and it was scary. He said the the last time meditation. Mm. Oh. And when he when he said, so you're doing something, you're looking at your wife or your kid and you say, you know, this could be the last time. Wow, that just snapped me right back into gratitude and, and appreciation it was such a powerful yeah. lesson. I love how you say uncertainty nurtures consideration. And, and the question, what if instead of uncertainty and judgment, you practiced a little more curiosity and consideration towards others, yourself, and your situation? So my question is, how might that change things? Mm. Well, again, um, what we're talking about is navigating our way past our default programming. You know, we are wired by biology and evolution to um, be quick to make value judgments about ourselves, about other people, about situations. You know, that's a bad person. That's a, this is a bad situation. Um, and you, we are also programmed to crave certainty. We want to know what's going to happen before it happens. We want to we want to know that this decision is the best decision, that this decision will get us the outcome. Um, and we are also programmed to explore the edges of our understanding and abilities. Now, we are both of these things at the same time all the time, and of course, some of us um, are born with a temperament and tolerance that, you know, it navigates one way or the other more often than not. But when we accept that, you know, we are both and, um, and that, uh, that we have the power to, ch to choose our story, choose our future, to, um, you know, define decide how we're going to see things, what we're going to decide and what we're going to do next, we have the ability to micro step our way into a new way of being, right? And so um, Nicola was talking about this earlier, like, if you want to be different than you are right now, you're probably going to have to start seeing and being and doing things differently. Um, and that happens through a change of habit that happens through uh, a change in practice. And this, if we can boil these things down to micro steps, they're easier um, to commit to, and it's easier to maintain a daily discipline of, of practice that will help us navigate our way into this new situation. If you look at the way the world is right now, if you were to look at media, whether it's social media or traditional media, I would assert that it appears that the people that are rewarded with fame and fortune are the people that appear to be and act with the greatest amount of certainty, um, maybe even hubris. And uh, if, if you're you know, now at the same time, if you look at these people that are being rewarded for their certainty with fame and fortune, uh, I would encourage you to ask yourself, do they appear to be really happy to you? Is, is this the kind of person that you would want to be? Um, in most cases, I have found that um, I wouldn't trade places with any of these people that, you know, are getting a lot of attention for um, certainty, especially because they're certain about things that that are not absolute, that can't possibly, you can't have certainty about them because there's nothing certain about it. So the, you know, the antidote to all this is curiosity and consideration and having the courage to remain curious and considerate. And so this is, I think, one of the most challenging things in the world to do because, you know, we were schooled to learn the right answers and repeat the right answers to, uh, we were told what the right thing to do was, and then we were, were rewarded for doing it. Um, and the idea that we can open the loop and consider other perspectives, other possibilities, 
explore other ways of um, seeing and being and doing things, um, and that this might be the way that we can find our way to reconnecting to who we really are, and what we're really good at, and where we really belong. Um, it's it's not the kind of journey um, that we see a lot at least again in in the media whichever media you're consuming and um we don't get a lot of training or encouragement to to think this way but i think that has been one of the most profound things for me because like everyone else i spent a lot of my life passing judgment um, on other people, passing judgment on myself, passing judgment on situations, both, you know, in my experience and outside my experience. Um, and I don't think I was a, a very happy person during all that time. I certainly didn't, I would not describe myself as experiencing a lot of equanimity or tranquility or joy. Um, I probably was experiencing more frequently frustration and jealousy and anger. Um, but the more I've been able to, to maintain open loops and to um, maintain a posture of curiosity and consideration, I have found myself experiencing more joy, fulfillment, uh, tranquility, equanimity, all of those things. And I have found that some of the other things that we're often chasing is ends in and of themselves have happened almost naturally, organically, you know, this idea of prosperity, reputation, um, purpose, passion, all the things that we're usually chasing as destinations, they become um, renewal, renewing resources that I can just continue to in, reinvest as I continue this process of trying to figure out, you know, who am I? What do I, what's next? Um, what's the best way for me to navigate my way forward? So I think Curiosity and consideration, um, just they're, again, they are the reward uh, that in and of themselves. And just, you know, just by cultivating those, um, that kind of posture, uh, I've found to be immensely beneficial, not just to my well-being and peace of mind, but also to my progress um, in all of my life's endeavors. Mm. That sparked a whole bunch of questions <laughs> again. Now, what I want to what I want to point out because it really stuck with me is this: mm, we are trained to to answer questions instead of being trained to ask the right uh, to to answer answers instead of being trained to ask the right questions, right? And to or to add, ask questions at all, it's what we were you what 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 you, we used to do as children ask 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 all the time. That's how we learned so quickly when we were children, and I think that is so needed in our world today to return to this place of asking questions and being curious, as you as you point out in opposition to just searching for the for the answers because searching for the answers i feel is more of a thing of it's about me but it's not about you and uh, so i love how you point that out that it is really a consideration for yourself and others and the situation and I, I, I just need to slip in one more thing. It's never the last, I know. One more thing, and that is because you're speaking about the emotions and, and you do that in a very, very well um, way. We've had our, our, one of our favorite teachers from our coach training, Dan Newby, on this, in, this podcast as our very first guest. And he wrote a book about emotional literacy. I don't know whether you read that, but that is, it's amazing. I highly recommend it because it really explains all the emotions we are fighting with all the time in such a great way and, and 
and you can just you can just see well if i'm triggered by this emotion what might it be what might be underneath it you know so that's that's very helpful do, do you remember years ago one of our <clears throat> favorite teachers who sadly now has passed he used to say you know there there are a lot of wagons out there that need fixing <laughs> <laughs> and I'm and I'm gonna be the one to fix them. <laughs> we'll be we'll be walking to the park and go. Oh, look at the color of that fence. How did they pick the trim on that house? They, well, you know, we never got the call. No, we never <laughs> got the call. They need that wagon fixed, but we just <laughs> never got the call. <laughs> all right, all right. We've got to move to. We have some limited time, and so, and so much I want to ask you about. So let's move to another one of your useful books called Trust Yourself, a simple three-step decision-making process to get unstuck and get going. And you include a beautiful quote from the German poet Goethe that says, as soon as you trust yourself, you will know how to live. Wow, those Germans, wow, <laughs> easy. <laughs> so people asking the question of what's next, are often, they're, they're struggling with making decisions. So would you teach our audience this three-step process and how Stoic philosophy fits with this and makes so much sense? Scott, just go as deep as you want. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. So Trust Yourself is, um, is like the third title of that book because it started off as a program that I created created really coming out of onward called stepping into possibility. And it was, again, I was trying to teach people this process to help them navigate their way through this difficulty that we we're all experiencing all at the same time, all at once during the pandemic. And um, it's, it, I par partnered with a friend of mine who um, is a, a leader in the military spouse world. Um, she and I presented this to several um, groups of military spouses. Uh, someone picked it up and invited us to come um, to Arlington, Virginia, and present it to uh, spouses of senior leadership, so like one to five star generals in, in the United States Army. Um, and it, you know, I, I practice teaching this so often, and it just the trust your, that Goethe quote kept. kept coming to mind because I, I heard that quote for the first time in um, the seventh grade, which was just a really pivotal time in my childhood. And I literally have chewed on that quote ever since because, uh, I, you know, some things are true because you they can be proven to be true and some things are true just because they're true, just on the face of it. And that I, you know, we were talking about worthiness early, earlier, and I think this is what we're really talking about is... Um, you know, do you trust yourself? Do you, you know, because if you have trust and faith in yourself that you can figure it out, that you can um, find your way, that you can forge ahead, that you can, um, you know, thrive as you strive, then you have the ability to navigate your way through a life that will bring a lot of fulfillment, a lot of joy, a lot of equanimity, not because it doesn't have any challenges, but because it has uh, plenty of challenges, but you have built this toolkit to make better decisions so that you can make a bigger difference. So the pro the, 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 the process is, is built off of those same three um, uh, stoic disciplines that we talked about earlier, um, but I've reframed them into my own language. So um, the first thing is what's now? what's happening right now and what i encourage people to do and there's exercises to help you is circling back to um what nicola was saying about emotions we are emotional creatures and we uh, and although stoicism sometimes has this reputation of denying or suppressing emotions it's actually not at all the case in ancient stoic philosophy we were taught to accept that we are emotional beings but to not attach to negative emotions that are going to impede our, our ability to thrive and prosper and make progress in our lives. And the way that um, I've decided that this can be done is we have to articulate 
the problem we're experiencing so that we are working on the problem and not allowing the problem to work on us. And the problem works on us when we um, let our amygdala fight, flight, or freeze uh, emotional brain take charge of the situation. And we attach ourselves to those emotions, which then bring on the feelings of anger, resentment, frustration, um, pity, what have you. So what's now? How can I articulate this as plainly as, plainly as possible without any adjectives or adverbs? Um, so as I walk through this, I'll just give you a, a real life example. I've been a freelancer all of my life as a musician, as a coach. Um, one of the things about being a freelancer is you're only making money when you have gigs in your calendar. And uh, anybody that's a freelancer knows the feeling of looking at your calendar and saying, oh my God, I don't have enough gigs on my calendar to make enough money to pay my bills. And so what happens? Your emotion, your amygdala kicks in, your emotional brain kicks in. And you say, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to cover my bills. I'm not gonna be able to pay the mortgage. Uh, my kids are gonna hate me. Uh, my wife is gonna leave me. My dog is gonna run away. Uh, I'm gonna end up homeless and living under an underpass in a box. I'm gonna become an alcoholic and I'm gonna die alone. And your brain goes to that like in just a second. What's really happening? I don't have enough gigs on my calendar to pay my bills this month. That's it. Objectively, that's what's going on. Um, second step, what's next? Well, I have to be able to, first of all, you know, have uh, created that objective mindset where the rational brain can come in, the prefrontal cortex can be invited into the conversation so that I can um, look at all the possibilities and um, decide and do the one that will help me close the gap between where I am and where I want to be. Now, you have to, again, um, practice a little restraint and have a, and practice a little bit more receptivity by saying, well, let's see, I could, I could, I could go get myself a part-time job to help cover um, the shortfall. I could, um, I could go through my list of subscriptions and apps and and delete all the things that I don't really need. Uh, I could, uh, you know, I know Peter, you and I would never do this, but I could take all those guitars <laughs> I don't play anymore and sell them on eBay and and bring a little money in. No, um, hell no. I, you know, and on and on. I could, I could call up all those happy customers I've had in the past and ask them if they have any referrals or if they, you know, if there's anything that they need right now. Um, so having framed all the possibilities, I can kind of go through that list and, you know, say, well, there's some things on here that are just um, not going to happen. Like I'm not going to quit being a freelancer and go get myself another uh, straight gig. Um, I might consider selling a couple of guitars. I might, you know, do any of these things. But the thing that probably makes the most sense as a um, efficient and effective step towards filling my calendar is if I reconnect with people that are already thrilled with the, the difference I help them make, they may need me again. They may have uh, recommendations or referrals that they want to pass along. Um, so I'll start there and I can do some of these other things too. And then I can just take off the table, all the things that are not up for consideration right now. So now I've objectively framed myself in my situation. I know what the pr real problem is and I'm not letting it, uh, not letting it drag me around. I am addressing the problem, um, objectively and directly and head on. I framed on my possible next steps. I've decided uh, to do the one, you know, one primary one that's going to probably help, has the greatest likelihood of closing the gap with the least amount of risk, um, the least amount of effort, and the most amount of optionality going forward. And now the last step is what matters. And what matters is practicing gratitude, acceptance, patience, humility, because decisions are not outcomes. I can make a really bad decision and have a good outcome. I can make a really good decision and have a really bad outcome. 
outcome is not up to me. The quality and integrity of my decisions and my efforts is up to me. And if I do that enough times, the law of averages is going to start playing in my favor. Um, and if I accept the next faded moment to circle back to the beginning of our conversation, all I've done is put myself in a situation where now I get to make the next best decision that I can make so that I can try to make, you know, find a better way forward. So I just rinse and repeat that process over and over and over, and I will be stepping into possibility. I am trusting myself um, and investing in my abilities uh, and becoming an active agent in whatever it is that destiny has in store for me. Just want to recap another learning clarity point for me, this idea of just stepping into possibility. Otherwise, you're cutting off possibility, but that calming down and stepping right into what's happening, stepping into possibility. I just wanted to point that out. It's also what what you say at the end of your your book onward, serve from the inside out. And that reminds me of living all in and full out, which is the theme of the, the great work of your life by Stephen Cope, whom you interviewed on your podcast, Creative on Purpose, which is, by the way, great. I love that interview. How can you translate that for a person looking to to figure out what's next? Um, this idea of, of playing your game all in and full out. Yeah, so this is a the the kind of the centerpiece of the work that I'm doing now, um, helping people, um, you know, live their best life in midlife and beyond. Um, is because again, the 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 crisis of midlife is if we wake up um, and discover that we're not that the pursuit of happiness has not made us happy. We've we've played the game of life by the you know, in external instruction and validation, uh, the rules set forth by institutionalized education and occupation. Um, we, we've got all the t-shirts, we've won all the prizes, uh, and yet we find ourselves in the, not feeling fulfilled, not feeling happy. Um, well, you can't win if you're actually playing someone else's game. And you certainly can't win a game that you've decided you don't want to play. The should life, as we say. Exactly. So playing your game means, you know, it, with with my clients, it's it's uh, getting involved in this process of let's let's reconnect with or rediscover who you really are, what you're really good at, where you really belong. Let's find that unique gift within you that's always been within you. Uh, and, and Stephen Cope's work, you know, speaks to this too, because we're both getting it from the same source, the Bhagavad Gita, that we all have this sacred duty, that um, if we don't embrace it and live it, it will destroy us. That quote from the Gospel of Thomas, um, if you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. If you don't bring forth what is within you, what you don't bring forth will destroy you. And this is the great catastrophe that we all have to navigate is are we living into our unique sacred gifts our soul's true calling our vocation how whatever language you want to use um that is the work that we are all meant to do um and if you can you know i by taking this process of let's Let's rediscover who you really are, what you're really good at, where you really belong at the intersection of that Venn diagram is the difference only you can make. And then we figure out how do we turn this into, um, it, it may be a, a business, it may be a cause, it may be a project, it doesn't matter. It's, it's something that we can build on and, um, and, and develop so that now that you've defined the difference only you can make, you can develop and deliver it. And it's through that developing and delivering the difference only you can make that you're going to experience a greater sense of thriving, flourishing, 
um, what we call living your legacy. Legacy isn't the money and monuments you leave behind. It's the difference you're making right now. And the difference you make right now is meant to be the difference only you can make. Um, and I've lost track of your question, so I hope I answered it. <laughs> you, you, you actually did answer it beautifully. And we are getting towards the end. This is a perfect way to end, actually. But I want to give you the well, opportunity to say if, if there's anything we didn't touch on that you really want our audience to know, or leave them with another, yet another pearl of wisdom of yours. Oh, well, I appreciate that. I mean, you all are great interviewers. I, I knew that from watching um, the episode with our, our mutual alt NBA friend. Um, so I, I, I think we've, we've certainly covered plenty. I'll just, I'll leave you with, um, the first exercise in my new, new book, the art of encore living, which is based on a quote from Marcus Aurelius, um, who has helped me navigate my life since the seventh grade. Um, and the, and you know, if you are in that moment of life where you, um, know that you're not living your soul's true calling. You have this wee small voice in the back of your head telling you that you can be and do more and better, but you don't know what that is. Uh, and you're seeking clarity. I think um, the most, uh, the, 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 you know, the process is the shortcut, as they say, and a process that I have um, tried with a lot of clients that's really worked is based on the Marcus Aurelius quote, think of yourself as dead, you have lived your life. Now, take what is left and live it properly. If you take a moment, if you're really feeling lost and unsure and uncertain about what you are meant to do or what you should do next, project yourself to that moment that you may or may not have the privilege of experience of having your a conversation with yourself on your deathbed and ask yourself, what are the things about my life that I celebrate and wish I had done more of? What are the things that I have done in my life where I have the deepest regrets and wish I had done less of? And after you have that conversation with yourself, now you have the great gift of knowing more about what you really want and maybe equally important or more important, more of what you don't want. Because now you can start to build uh, a plan and start to uh, construct a life that um, will give you more of those moments of celebration and less of those moments of regret. And you can start developing this daily discipline of taking a small step into that possibility every single day from here on out. Very, very, oh. very nice. Um, Beautifully said. Of love course. it. So. And of course, those moments are enriched by making a difference, not only in your life, but also in the life of others. So let's continue. Do that. Thank you so much for being here with us, Scott. And I, I hope uh, when book 9, 10, 11 comes out, we'll have another conversation. Huh? <laughs> It is a privilege uh, to know you both and to witness the, the difference that you're making and to be invited on this broadcast and to have this conversation is an extraordinary gift and I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you, Scott. We hope you enjoy this interview. A big takeaway for me was the stoic idea that the only thing that matters is virtue, the content of your character not just what you believe in, but how you show up and how you engage with the people you find yourself with. And I really like the idea that you can't be anxious and curious at the same time. That's good news, because I've rarely met anyone who's more curious than you. <laughs> to learn more about Scott, head to whatsnext.com forward slash 29, where we share the transcript, links, and more. Again, that's whatsnext.com forward slash 29. And if you like what you've heard, share it with someone you care about and subscribe, rate, and review 
our Inside Out Career Design Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Or watch it on our YouTube channel, whatsnext.com and subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. That's where you can also leave your questions about this week's episode or a topic you'd like us to cover in a future episode. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next week for another episode. Same time, same place.